Happy 2019. I love the energy of a brand new year because we're open to more possibilities. This year could be your best year ever and let's do whatever we possibly can to make it so. Less stress, more money, more time to yourself and your family. And I wanna help you do that as best as humanly possible. We're actually going to come up with a new podcast series. It's actually going to be on this show on Eventual Millionaire, but I'm going to be coaching you. Yes, hopefully you. Maybe not you, you, but you. So if you apply, maybe it can be you. (laughs) So we're looking for six-figure owners in whatever niche, industry, anything. And I'm going to be coaching you, quote unquote, live, right? And if you're feeling very vulnerable about sharing potentially numbers or anything, we can totally put a cool like superhero mask on you and a voice changer so you sound super awesome. So that way I can give you the advice that you need that will make a huge change in your business for 2019. So if you go to eventualmillionaire.com slash laser, L-A-S-E-R. You can apply for that. We're taking six amazing business owners. Amazing as a human. You don't have to have an amazing business. Don't worry. I will help you make it amazing. Again, it's eventualmillionaire.com slash laser. Potent advice and inspiration from real self-made millionaires. Welcome to The Eventual Millionaire with your host, Jamie Masters. Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I am Jamie Masters, and I have my wonderful friend back on the show, Honoré Corder, and she's got an amazing new book that came out that has a swear word, so I'm going to try not to say it. It's called Stop Trying So Effin' Hard. She also has a whole you might you must write a book live coaching course. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm so excited to be with you. We were just discussing the book title beforehand, and I was like, okay, don't tell me all the things yet because I would like everybody else to hear it. So how did you come up with such a wonderful name? Well, Jamie, I'm so glad you asked. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for asking. Um, You know what? I really struggled a little bit with the effing in the title, and the reason that I chose it is because it's an attention getter. People pay attention when someone swears who does not normally swear, right? You know, there's like your grandmother who all of a sudden like whips out a, the, the D word or the, the B word, right? Or like my mother-in-law said the S word yesterday. She just had knee surgery. So I chalked it up to drugs. But when someone who doesn't normally swear swears, which is me, I, I swear in general conversation on occasion, but usually it's for making emphasis, right? So I put the emphasis on a different syllable so that someone will pay attention. And I wanted people to pay attention to the message of my book. And it worked because that's the first thing I saw on our little sheet that I have here. I'm like, oh, I really, I really like that. Especially the whole point of it. So tell me of the whole point of the book too. I know you're trying to get the attention so that way you can put attention to the message. So tell me what the message of the book is. The message is that people are spending a lot of time, and I'm almost 50. This is where you give me your shock face. You look face. amazing. It is. Look, do you see the shock face? Thanks. Jeez, Thanks geez. so much. But I've watched people for a super long time buy things they can't afford to impress people they don't like so that the people that they don't like will like them. And it's exhausting mm-hmm. to do those things and to be someone that you are not so that people that you don't like, that you're buying things that you can't afford to impress those people will pay attention to you and like you. And I want them to stop it. (laughs) So you swear at them and then they stop. That's how that goes, right? (laughs) What is she saying? I, I just, I see a lot of people on antidepressants and anti anxiety medicine. And what are they anxious about? They're anxious about what's going to happen when someone finds out the thing, whatever the thing is, that whatever, and they're going to be judged and, oh, they're walking around and they're freaking themselves out and they're, or they're not on any medicine at all, but they're medicating with the following options, drugs, sex, food, television, etc., and so forth. And I did it for about 30 seconds a long time ago in my 20s. And then I just decided that it was exhausting and I don't like to be tired. So I stopped doing it. And yet my work has been as a business coach and executive coach and working very intimately with people. And it didn't matter how much someone made or how successful they were. They still had this little voice in their head that said, I'm not good enough. I'm going to be judged. No one's going to love me. No one's going to like me. 
And it doesn't have to be that way. And that's the message of the entire book is giving people permission to take 100% responsibility to say no when they feel like saying no, to say yes when they feel like saying yes, and to not be so tired and exhausted and anxious all the time. So how do we do that? Because it it seems like we're preconditioned for this stuff, right? Everybody's like, oh, but this is the way it is. And we're robots and we keep doing it. So how do we snap ourselves out of that program? Because unfortunately, it's like a program running in our heads. That's why we're medicating with it as much as we can. Yeah. So it's to recognize what makes you truly happy. What is the, ask yourself some good questions. What would make me really happy? What do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? What do I need to let go of? Who do I need to let go of? Whose opinion should matter? So I can I can focus on that for a second, which is, I think, this is the, the, the general consensus just from people that I've talked to, people I've worked with and people that I've talked to also, is that there is this, um, I take on the opinions of other people without qualifying them as someone who, who should have an opinion. I have learned this the hard way. So thanks for bringing that up. I'd be like, but they said it was like this. Someone was like, and where's that coming from? It's like, oh, they, yeah. hmm, it's just an opinion. Yeah. And I, I used to wait, a, like I didn't, um, I took an opinion because I love data. I love taking uh-huh. as much information as possible and like parsing and figuring out what I like. But then I didn't yeah. wait the opinions. I didn't go, oh, they actually yeah. don't know what they're talking about. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. You got a 4.0 from the East German judge and they have no... <laughs> Right. <laughs> East Germany is not in this uh, <laughs> in this in this uh, equation at all. So it's asking yourself, you know, who what's what are my circles of influence, right? So we have the um the intimate circle. The people who are your best friends, your family, the people who see you on a daily basis, they know your heart. They know your mind, they know all of the things about you and if they give you feedback, you might want to listen. Then you have the inner circle, also people that are close to you, but you don't see them on the regular, perhaps. And then there's everyone else. And the question that I ask myself is, and this is a little funny, and there's a reason that it's funny is because it'll, you'll remember it later, is if I killed someone and I needed to hide a body, would I call this person to help me hide the body? And if the answer is no, then they probably don't get to give you their opinion. I had someone ask me that. I was like, but I'm, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to hide a body. They're like, it's rhetorical, Jamie. It's, it's fine. Rhetorical. <laughs> stop, yes. stop being crazy. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't actually kill someone. We'd hide it. I, I mean, mean like, come on, really. I mean, We're smart. It's an air show, okay. We can afford to buy someone for this particular task. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I love you. Okay, so when when <laughs> when they go through the the book too, like there's there's so many pieces that they could do. If you could highlight like the top thing, because that's the other thing. Everyone's like, I know I'm supposed to be working on my mindset and paying attention to all these things. It just sounds like so much more work to do. And you just told me to stop trying so hard. So now yeah. I got up, right. If it's hard, then stop doing it. Take a minute to to take a nap, and then ask yourself a better question. Tell me, tell me about how you do this in your own life, because you're a mom and you're a businesswoman and you've got all these things. So everybody's with excuses of like, oh, well, she can do it because whatever. How do you, do you stop and take a nap? Like, will you? I do. I do. I take a nappuccino and a nappuccino is 200 milligrams of caffeine plus a 25 minute meditation. Oh. Yeah. I use the Pizzizz app, P-Z-I-Z-Z. Nice. Okay. So you take so the I caffeine use- right before and then you meditate. Yeah, you- and then I take the the nap. So it's a it's a sleep. They talk you into a sleep and they talk you out of a sleep. Oh. Basically a little meditation nappy thing. And by the time you, they talk you out of the sleep, the caffeine is kicked in and it's like you've had a three or four hour siesta. Thank you. And you're back, you're back on the road. It's like a little pit stop. It's like a little NASCAR pit stop for your mind. You get to just turn the brain off give the body a little rest, and then bam, you're right back at it. Otherwise, I could not get up at 4.30 and write and go to the gym and work with all the people and have a little break and then go again until late in the day. Otherwise, I would be <laughs> would be hiding bodies. <laughs> <laughs> Many of them, apparently. Okay. If I, am not, if I am not well-fed and well-rested, I am slightly less pleasant than right now. Well, okay. So that I... That's a very valid point, right? And you did uh, the Miracle Morning books with Hal Elrod, and and so you're you're four thirty in the morning, 
that's yeah. early. And so you have to have techniques and yeah. tactics to be able to not be hangry and all that fun stuff. So give yeah. me give me some more of those because that's the thing. People, are, you need to find what's right for you. I'm going to try the Nappuccino thing. That sounds amazing. I meditate, but I don't have caffeine right before. That's genius. Give us what else you do to try and manage all the amount of work that you do during the day. Well, I slow down to speed up. I do a lot of the slowing down to speed it up. I have alarms on my phone that go off all day. As a matter of fact, right before I got on this, because I had gotten the reminders of the be quiet and be on time and all of that, it reminded me to look and make sure that I didn't have any alarms that are going to go off like during church and, you know, all those fun times. And it's like, whose phone is making the wah, wah, wah? It's like, not me, that guy. Um, I have alarms to remind me to do things. So I do a twice a day meditation because I have an alarm that wakes me up to do a meditation. And then I have an alarm that says, okay, it's time to write. So two minutes before my hour of writing, I have a little alarm that's basically the coffee reminder, right? I call it time to write, but it's really fill up your coffee cup and then write something. Um, I use the power of technology for lots of things among them, just the simple alarm on my phone that says it's time to do the next thing. I don't have to remember to do it because I have put a system in place that reminds me to do it. Oh, okay. So in that, in that way, it's the not trying too hard because it's already pre partitioned and you don't have to think about it again. Like I've already predetermined my day, my week, my month and my year before I ever show up. Your whole year? I do. I sit down and I do a plan about this time of year, actually. I'm, I'm headed to Best Year Ever, Hal's Best Year Ever Blueprint. And what I normally do at the beginning of December is I look at what is my production schedule for next year. We have Miracle Morning books that are coming out. We, I have my own personal books that are coming out. I'm doing a mastermind. I'm doing a live coaching course. All of those things have to go on my calendar. P.S. And by the way, I want to go to Paris. I want to go to London. I want to go to Tuscany. I want to take a nap every day. And if I'm not intentional with my time, then I don't get all of the things done. And I don't like getting to the end of the year and looking back at all the goals at the beginning of the year and going, oh, yeah, I didn't really get to around to all of those things or any of those things. Because you've been intentional. Yeah, I pre-planned and I'm intentional. But and I and every hour of my calendar is full But before anyone panics or like presses the stop button, like, okay, I'm not even going to listen to that nonsense. (laughs) Her book is called Stop Trying So Effing Hard and Wait a Minute, Every Second is Scheduled. And it sounds like she's trying really hard. (sighs) But actually, I take lots of breaks. I've learned that I'm really good from 4.30 in the morning until the nappuccino. And then I learned that I'm good after the nappuccino until about 3.30 or 4. But I don't do anything with any person before 1030 in the morning. So if someone wants to talk to me, what time are you available? How early can you get there? Like, you're a morning person. How's seven? I'm like, nope. <laughs> seven o'clock, I'm already pre, pre-booked pre from now until 2024 or 2042. So no, that's not going to work. I don't meet with anyone before 1030. And I don't start anything after three because if it's an hour, I want to be done by four. Because by about four, I've been going at it for 12 hours. That's a long time. How do you get in flow? Like, especially when you're so scheduled, because I know that's the other piece. Like, I use a master schedule, but I am an entrepreneur that is like, I have chunks. I can't go every second, right? And so I do chunks with breaks. So I'll write for 50 minutes and take a 10 minute break. But you're that regimented and you can tap into flow because you know the way that you work and you can tap in anyway. Yeah. So then here's a, then here's another ninja tip, right? Which I think is what you're looking for. Like, how do I get myself ready? If you read a book like Atomic Habits, which is a new book by James Clear. It's downstairs. I have one. Yeah. um, He talks about something that I learned, right? I didn't read about it. I learned it and then he validated it with science. So I thought I was, you know, I could do a little hair flip for that. Um, But it's, if you, listen to, he talks about sex when he's doing it. So this, you know, your listeners are going to tune in and they're like, oh, they talk about sex at the, uh, what time is it? Uh, At the 16 minute mark. You can put that in your little writing copy. Um, but he talks about how, if you listen to the same romantic song that gets you in the mood right before you have sex several times, then if you hear that song out in the wild, then instantly you're going to be in the mood. I'm using that strategy for other things also. <laughs> All the men listening are writing this down going, okay, wait, I'm preconditioning my wife. <laughs> I need to get my wife excited on Tuesday night at seven. What is the song? Excellent. 
Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, and Wednesdays. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I have the alarm that says, go get the coffee. It's time to write. Now at six o'clock in the morning, I'm so conditioned to write. That's what I do. Really? Okay. Because yeah. it's been a habit for such a long time. So do you feel like, ha- are there days though, because writing is always an interesting thing and people ask like, you're prolific. You have so many books. You have so much stuff. You love writing, I'm assuming, most of the time anyway, right? Uh, and so <laughs> so how do you uh, not get bored? Do you have days that feel like sludge uh, and you just write anyway? How does all that go? Um, yes. I, I'm, a, I'm human. I'm not a robot. And so this is my this is <laughs> This is in my lap when I'm writing or working. So she says, I'm going to, I need to be on the show too. Um, um, yeah. So I, I have little tricks that I put in place. So for example, I've got the alarm that says it's time to write. I go get the coffee and the tea and I sit down and now I'm ready to write. I've got a little candle, right? So it smells good. And I'm like, all of these things say, okay, Honoré, it's time to write. What I do at the end of my writing session is I make notes of the flow that I'm in. Once I get into flow, it might take me five or 10 minutes, but then I'm off to the races because I've outlined, right? Part of a previous writing session would be outlining what I'm going to talk about. Then at the end of the, the session, at about five minutes to the hour, I get an alarm that says, it's time to wrap up. I've got five minutes to get myself ready for tomorrow's writing session. Wow. So I make little notes. Yep. I make little notes about where I am and I'll start sentences and then I'll say, write more about this here and research this a little bit and do this and do that. And when I come back, Honoré of tomorrow gets to step into where Honoré of today finished off. And fast enough so that way you can get into flow. Because an hour is not that much time for writing. Um, you know what I now can do between 1,000 and 2,000 words in an hour? And a, a book is 30 to 60,000 words. So I'm, I can pop out a book every 30 to 60 days because it's not by accident and I'm not a robot. I just figured out what works for me. So there, my husband is and will forever be an evening person and will say, I don't care what your science says. I don't care what your habits book says. I don't care how much self-talk. I'm never going to be a morning person because you know what? I don't want to be a morning person. And if that's you, if you're a night worker outer, then you go work out at night. If you're an afternoon writer, you write in the afternoon or at night. You have to figure out what works for you and then do that. That's what I think people, they miss. They say, well, I'm not a morning person. I don't want to be a morning person. Well, then what time of day are you going to do the things? <laughs> because You have free choice. Exactly. You choice, but you actually have to do the things, right? <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. So I, I, that's let's actually talk about that a little bit because when I when I look at yeah. stop trying so hard, yes, I feel like we're thinking about the stuff we're supposed to be doing more than that we're actually doing the stuff we're supposed to be mm-hmm. doing, right? And I feel like that's where the conundrum is oh. also because like I have to do this thing, I have to do this thing. I'm supposed to write, I'm supposed to write, or whatever the thing is, right? And they won't actually do it. Yeah. And you, it sounds like you've yeah. gotten really good at that chunk also. Yes. Yes. So the the piece that I think could be missing is accountability. Okay. And you have lots of options. When I was writing the aforementioned Stop Trying book, I had a whole bunch of life stuff going on. Moving, sick father-in-law, lots of daughter graduating. I, I had a list of valid excuses or reasons why I didn't need to write. Mm-mm, nope, I'm busy. I have all the things on my, on my list. Yep. And yet... My editor was booked and you can't book her. She's months and months and months in advance. We got down to the hard stop deadline time period, those last, you know, two or three weeks before the manuscript is supposed to be turned in. And I don't like to miss a deadline. I don't want to pay my editor for her not editing. That seemed like a waste of money. And about that time, one of my girlfriends called me and she said, I have to get this book done. And every time I get an accountability partner, they flake out on me. And I said, oh, really? Hmm, what's that like? <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> I was like, I, well, so I said, how about we do this writing hour together? So at two minutes to the hour while I'm pouring my coffee, I'm going to call you and say, okay, bud and see, let's do this. And then at the top of the next hour, when we're done, we check in and say we wrote. And it only took me 11 days to finish the manuscript because it was the only thing left on my to-do list 
And I was in the middle of moving and all the things. So it was the one thing I told my family, this is my hour. I have to write every single day. And if I can find the time the rest of the day, I'm going to do that also. I didn't do an entire book in 11 days. Some of it was written, but I wrote from 7,000 words to 34,000 words from Monday of one week to Thursday of the following week. And I did write on Sunday, which normally on Sundays, I actually just use my writing time for reading because I'm a big nerd and I like to read. Because <laughs> you don't so, have to write every single day of the week. That's great. <laughs> if you're a full-time writer, part of your job is to read. Oh, it's like... It's funny that you say that, though. Do it doesn't it. seem like that's a thing. Do you know it doesn't I mean? seem like that? No. Or it, well, it does seem like It doesn't. So when you're a writer, you're being very, very pro- prolific. It it seems like you'd be like, no, I just dealt with words all day long. Like the last thing I want to do is go read a bunch of books all the time. Well, I read nonfiction because it's interesting to me and I like to learn. I read fiction because I want to write fiction. I'm actually working on my first fiction-y thing right now. Oh, that's awesome. So okay. um, after talking about writing fiction and not doing it because I was working and writing nonfiction prolifically, I just decided to stop saying I was going to do it and actually start doing it. So I've been writing 500 words a day. It takes me between 10 and 20 minutes every day. But it's amazing what you can get done if you just say, this is the one thing I'm going to do and I'm going to do it until it's done. And here's my target. I'm a very small target. Is that what you do in your in your coaching course? Because like uh, we set up this whole thing on writing books, right? Because I I was like, I'm not a writer, and then you read Jeff Goins' book, you're a writer, right? And it's it's a lot of mindset yeah. stuff of like, oh, you actually just have to keep showing up. So what are some of those things? Do you provide the accountability? What are the things that you found that actually help people write that are not typically like I write every day because I'm not a write every day kind of person. So you're, you're asking about my course, which is you're asking a couple of different questions. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, if you're not a writer, but you want to write a book, is that what I'm hearing? Is that the gap? This is our chasm. <laughs> if- I write a book. I'm not a writer. Can we connect these two? Sure. Right? Yes. Yes. Well, the first thing is when, when in my course, so this kind of references my course, I have 10 sessions, but I don't call session one, session one. I call it session zero. Mm -hmm. What most people don't do before they write a book is think about some critical things that they might want to think about before they write a book, such as what's in it for me, meaning the writer. So you, Jamie, Mm -hmm. if you were to write another book, because I know you have, you know, I know you have a fancy pants book. (laughs) Um, If you were to write another book, the first question to ask yourself is, what's in it for me? What do I want from my book? Do I want money? Do I want fame? Do I want recognition? Do I want authority? Do I want multiple streams of income? Am I taking my knowledge and making it the first piece of my funnel? What's in it for me? That's the very first question that you need to ask yourself really about anything, right? I want a boyfriend. Why do you want a boyfriend? (laughs) What's in it for me? (laughs) See aforementioned sex discussion. I know exactly where I went also. Yep. Okay. Continue. We've we've talked about this already. (laughs) Then you want to ask yourself, what um, do I want the reader to do when they read my book? What's the reader get out of it? What do I want them to do? What do I want them to not do? And then what do I want the right and perfect reader to do? So uh, let me dive into that a little bit more so it's not confusing. When I wrote You Must Write a Book, I wrote You Must Write a Book because I wanted readers to write a book. I This is the do. I want you to not write a crappy book. So I'm going to go against popular uh, click culture, you know, clickbait culture, which is I don't think you can write a book in a weekend. I don't think you can outsource entirely writing your book with just a few hours of your time and lots of money, right? Not the book that you're going to be proud of later, not the book that's going to work for you infinitely, not the book that's going to be the best earner for a long time, but will, you know, getting a bestseller tag on Amazon, to, you know, because you've sold five books to your grandmother and it'll show up in an obscure category. I don't think that's what people have in mind when they think, oh, I need to write a book. But that's where they end up if they don't do some considering. Okay, so I wanted people to write a good a book and I wanted them to not write a crappy book. Ultimately, the right person says, there's a whole lot of information in here, but I'm still figuring out some things. I'd rather just pay you. <laughs> so, so the person who reads you must write a book 
and goes through it can write and publish and market a solid book. The, the absolute right person for me is going to say, here's my American Express card. Just walk me through this because I've got more money than time and I want to figure this out and I don't want to question it. You know, I don't want to wonder if I'm making the right decision and you have 51 books. I have zero. So let's do this. Right. Yeah, so definitely. that would, that was the purpose of my book. So a lot of times people will hire me and they will say, I want to become a speaker. I want to make more money as a speaker. How do I do that? I want to write a book that positions me as an authority. When you are an author, you are the authority. You make more money from your book. You make more money as a speaker. You can charge more as a coach or a consultant. You can do a course based on your book. You can repurpose your content. Lots of places to go from the core content of your book. Mm. And that's what my course covers is I help people to, to, know all of the things by the end that they wouldn't otherwise know unless they had, you know, a, a decade, you know, a couple decade. hundred thousand dollars and a lot of free time to figure things out. Right. Yeah. The pain, yeah. the pain that was writing my first book was, yeah, it's very adamant. And I think that's, uh, you don't know what you don't yeah. know. And uh, I've had quite a few people trying, uh, telling me to write a book now, but because I had such a painful experience writing the previous book. I'm a little gun shy. Hence the reason why I'm asking you all these questions, right? Right. Once bitten, twice shy. Yeah. Once bitten, twice shy. Yes. And the right coach, I'm a big believer in coaching because I, I had a coach. I was successful with a coach. I became a coach. I work with people. I still have coaches and mastermind partners and lots of people that when I don't know where to, you know, it's like cutting frozen butter with a cold knife or cutting soft butter with a hot knife. They're two different experiences. And one is pleasurable and you have more butter because melted butter, you know, if there's more of it. How do you cold <laughs> butter. And the, that you stab <laughs> and then stab hide and the body. <laughs> and you're, you're frustrated. It should be easy. So if I don't know how to do something, I want to go hire the person who has the experience and can just guide me through it. What are, you know, what's, where do I put the fulcrum? <laughs> what, right. Where, where does the sharp tip of the spear go? How do I do this? Because before I was like, I was just supposed to write. Okay, great. And then I started reading and it takes forever. But when, when is the right time for this? So that's sort of, I know I will write another book. I'm not saying I won't, yeah. but yes. Dot, dot, dot. Well, <laughs> right? So knowing that I I low, yes. she can write one in 11 and a half days. No. Uh, but, yeah. but for me, I know it, it's it, such a, um, a process to go, when is the right time? Especially because it takes, typically, it takes away from the core business side of things to start focusing on all that extra time on something else. So how do you help people finding when the right time is? Well, there's no wrong time to do it. And sometimes it's like having a baby, right? (laughs) It's like, when is the right time to have a baby? Well, there's no real right time because you get about 18 years of no sleep. So you just have to, there's no right time to, to factor that in. Ultimately, when you have a message that's bursting to come out and from a business perspective, you want to turn knowledge that you have into multiple streams of income. One of the things that I like to do is make money and, and the other one is help people to make money. I like to help them turn their core knowledge into multiple six figure streams of income. That's one of my favorite things to do. If you can take your knowledge and put it in, um, easily consumable format, we would call that a book, but then you can multi-purpose that. And I call that in my course, the wheel of fortune. Mm -hmm. So it's lots of different ways to make money from the same content. And the, the more you're involved, the more you make from doing it. A book is 15 or $20 or maybe even $5 or $10 in ebook format. But you can take that same thing and have a workbook and that's 20 or $30. And you could take that exact same content and turn it into a course that people buy and you don't talk, right? You've already done the talking. They're just buying that time with you. And that's a hundred dollars or $500 or a thousand dollars. And then the live coaching courses, the live events, those sorts of things are four figures and five figures all the way. And it's exactly the same information. Tony Robbins was the first one that I kind of saw do this. His Awaken the Giant Within book is Personal Power, which became Personal Power 2, which is UPW, Unleash the Power Within, Mm -hmm. the event, Date with Destiny, Life Mastery. You could have, you got everything you needed except for the experience 
from Awaken the Giant Within. If you study that book, you didn't need to go to all the other things. But if you get that first taste of the crack, you're like, oh, I really like this Tony Robbins guy. You go buy Personal Power 2. I don't know. Is it just me? You buy Personal Power and then he comes out with Personal Power 2. You're like, this must be totally different. I need to spend another two or $400, right? Of course, and then you go to UPW and that's the $800 weekend. It's not $800 anymore, but I'm old. So when I went <laughs> the first time in the early 90s, it was $795. And I borrowed half the money for my boyfriend to go to the, the weekend. And then I broke up with him because I got some clarity. And then I went... <laughs> Best investment ever. No. <laughs> My best investment ever was like clarity with a love relationship. Um, and then I went to the live events and I, you know, I continued into Tony's funnel over the years, yeah. right? Because it was good information and I kept getting my needs met with personal growth and personal development and, and the power of environment and being around people and meeting people and all of those things. Exactly the same content. Mm. Every person has the ability to do that. It's just how do you do it? What's the best way to do it? What are the different options that you have? And there are lots of them and figuring that out. That's, really that's what I was, it's a really fun game. I like your, I like your attitude on it. Cause I guess that's sort of the question I've, we've got a whole six month program. Yeah. So in my head, I'm like, I, I want to just take that and put in a blog post, whatever content and chunk it down and then make my book that way. Instead of starting from the book, I know, look at your face. So I figured you'd, you'd make a thing. So what is the, what do you think is typically the optimal way to do it. I wouldn't chunk it in a blog post, but I would have to know more about your program in order to help you effectively turn it into a book. People do make the mistake of just blogging and then throwing it into a book, but then there's no journey that the reader goes on. You remember that my first question is what's in it for you, but the yep. second question is what do you want the reader to do as a result of reading your book? Yep. Right. So it's like, what's the journey that they're going to go on? The, the, the hero's journey in a way for, for fiction is not unlike the hero's journey in nonfiction. You start with, I have this problem. Mm -hmm. When you pick up a nonfiction book, it's I have a problem. You may not call it a problem or you may not even know you have a problem. But you're you're trying to, to transform from one type of, of person or one type of perspective to another type of perspective. You're trying to put some some good mind power on your situation. Totally. So where does your where does your course in those six months take someone? And how would they navigate that if they were reading versus taking your course and talking See. to you personally? Well and that to me is so what's so interesting. I, there's there's I've been researching there's not that many books about course design. There's a lot about how to write books. And so uh -huh. it's an interesting it's an interesting thing um, to be able to teach something, mm -hmm. whether it be in written form or in course yep. sort of format. So do you, do you have any opinions on how that goes? Like, do you feel like they are, they're easily mapped to each other? Well, I, for me, it's very logical. It's what's the first thing if you were, you, so you're doing a course on how to design a course. Oh no, 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 not me. I'm no. just saying, no, you're just saying, Oh, okay. Well, so whatever it is, it's it, when you're, when you're writing a book or when you're designing a course, I think the messages are very similar. It's what's the first thing you do and then what's next and then what's next and then what's next. And then when you're publishing a book, you have tracks mm -hmm. as you're, and I'll give you an example. As you're writing the book, you want to commission your cover. People come to me and they say, okay, I want to hire you. My book is 80% done. And I'm like, that's what you think because <laughs> it isn't. If you didn't start with all these questions, then you're 80% done with the word count you think you need to write the book, but you're not 80% done, right? As you're writing the book, you want to hire a graphic designer to de design the book cover. You want to book your editor. So you have these tracks that you're on. You've got the writing track and then you've got the production track and then you've got the marketing track which is the launch and the marketing of the book. And those things are running simultaneous to each other. It's kind of like making Thanksgiving dinner. You know, while the turkey's in the oven, you got to boil the potatoes. You got to, you know, got to get the potatoes ready, boil the potatoes, mash the potatoes. You got to melt the butter, melt, melt the butter. Before <laughs> you try to put it in the potatoes, right? We got to melt the butter every time. That or get your butter melted, depending on what the topic is. <laughs> <laughs> so you have these different tracks that you're on. It's very similar for, for your course. When you're putting together the course, and when I did, when I do my course, as I and I like to do it live because I think Memorex, if that's a reference anyone would know, right? <laughs> live oh, or Memorex? Is it live or is it Memorex? Right? Um, I think a recorded course, again, like a book, can give people a lot of what they need, but not everything. I like the exchange of 
well, what do I do here? And what about this? And let me think, you know, let's talk about this. I talk about how when you're producing your book, there is the outlining and writing phase of the book. And while you're doing that, there are all these other little things you need to be doing too. So that when your book comes back, final time from the editor, proofreader and formatter, by the way, this is your bench of people. Do you know who goes on your bench? I don't know, right? But when it finally comes back and you're ready to publish it, that's not the time to go, okay, well now I need a book cover. That was me. I was like, oh, now, I'm, now I start marketing, right? That's how we do this? No, that's not what you do? Darn it. <laughs> Lesson no, learned many years ago. Yes, and also it's marketing it has no end date, right? Yeah. There's no, your marketing is not an avocado. It's never done. <laughs> you never just never say, heard that before. and we're out. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and the, 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 what's great about have you having the knowledge though, is then you can give the on-demand little teeny pieces. Whereas for me, the, the book writing in itself was such an energy expenditure that I was like, and I have plans for the marketing, but my capacity is nil right. so therefore it's not going to be until this chunk of time when i have to right. but you've pre-partitioned all of your chunks of time yes yes and you and when you recognize that marketing is a little it's a piti piti energive which is a haitian saying for little by little we we will arrive right a little by little so marketing is a little bit every day a little bit every day when i'm writing in my bullet journal my things to do every day I've got my AMS, my Amazon marketing services ads that I run every day or every other day. I'm just constantly putting in new ads. I'm constantly filling my buffer with my social media posts. Right? It's like, it's not, it's not a huge thing. It's not, I'm marketing today <laughs> forever. It's a little bit every single day, just little pieces of, of hot knife through butter stuff that I know works right? The, the tip of the spear, the things that the 80% that make up, you know, the, that take 20% of the time, but make up 80% of the results. I'm doing those things on a consistent basis. So I'm never behind. And I don't feel like I'm going to write the whole book today. Okay. Tomorrow I'm going to do all of the marketing. And then the next day I'm going to die because that's not possible. <laughs> I love that idea though, of chunking it into little tech. What are some of the other things for book marketing that actually work right now? Um, content is king, showing that you are the expert and giving, give everything that you know away for free and people will come and pay you for your time and attention and your knowledge. So in pulling Be out the pieces from the book and you can put those into blog posts, is that how we do it or how yeah. do you, okay. <laughs> and also taking, um, taking a piece of information that I didn't, because a book can be 400,000 pages long and someone will use it to prop their door open for when they're taking their groceries in from the car, they won't read it because it's too much, mm -hmm. right? So any particular topic that I can go deeper in, I will do that. So I have, you must write a book and I talk about how to write a book, but I have done a few posts on here are the three things you can do to start writing your book, or here are the five things you need to know to publish a book that's well done, right? That would rival any professional, uh, traditional publisher. And taking a little piece that? of knowledge and writing that and sending that out and mm -hmm. then saying, hey, if you haven't read this yet. And you write those blog posts too. You don't have somebody like spin, like take the articles or take your content and do it. You're, you're the writer. You do all the things. I am a writer, so I do it. <laughs> but I do, I do have clients who are, that is not their bailiwick. That is not one of their areas of genius and they are better served doing something else. So I connect them with content creators who are able and willing to do that. And they are writer writers. And if you're a, a capital W writer, writing is your thing, then you will do that easily. And if not, if it's not your area of genius, then commission someone to do that. Again, it's where do you put the fulcrum? How do you get the most for the least? And sense. if you don't want to do that, you, st you still need blog posts. You still need to create content that's valuable that people would pay to get. And yet they're getting it for free. The question they're going to ask themselves is what else? what else can I get from this person? And if they can afford it, then I'm just going to engage this person. Yeah, before, right. Um, totally. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, if you're an expert in something and I don't know how to do it and I've got an American express card, guess what? You have my American express card on file. That's how this game works. 
<laughs> Yay, because you like money and hey. you like rent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Oh, but everybody wins in that situation. It's not a it's not just a win for me, the service provider, for you, the course giver. Yeah. It it's meant to be a win win win. It's a it's an I win, a you win, and then together we create a greater win. That's my intention always. Well, and with the book, it provides the know, like, and trust that way they are okay with investing in you, even if it is lower, pri- higher priced uh, programs and stuff. Where does, before we wrap up before the last question, where does multimedia fit in this? Because I am a video gal, not a right. Re- I can write. I just don't typically, it's not my zone yeah. of genius. And so how do, how do we infuse that into it? So I've been doing recordings um, or doing videos, but then it feels fragmented. Whereas it feels like it would be better if I did write a book and then put pieces, videos made from that content to begin with. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, again, it's you honoring yourself and what works best for you. If you like video, then your avatar, and we didn't really talk about what an avatar is, but an avatar is your ideal reader. It's the absolute right and perfect person. If the absolute right and perfect person were reading your book, watching your videos, listening to your podcast, who is that person? And ultimately for you, they might ought to be the same person, right? So if, if you, your avatar would then be someone who likes to consume their content via video yes, or audio. I, I, <laughs> I have my book cover on the back cover of my phone. I got a book cover made for my, uh, my phone cover. And the guy today that was uh, shampooing my hair, God bless him. uh, Speaking of delegating to people who have an area of genius, right? He said, Oh, I like your phone cover. I'm reading your phone cover. And I said, Oh, are you a reader? And he said, Oh, I read exactly one book. And I was like, Oh, well, that's the end of this conversation. Except (laughs) it wasn't because we were still taught. We were still together at that moment. He had his hands in my, in my hair. So I had to keep talking. You're not my avatar. No, go away. You are not. Well, (laughs) but I'm a writer. I'm a reader. Like what? I don't understand what's happening up there. What are you doing with all of this space? Uh, But I said, if you tried audiobooks, he said, I really like to listen to things, but so I don't have time to sit and read. I said, Oh, you drive to work, you exercise, like, you know, you have time when you are doing things that your brain isn't occupied. It's just your driving or whatever. And he said, yeah, he said, Oh, I, there are audiobooks. I got to give someone the gift of learning that there are great audiobooks. I know your head's exploding right wow. now. I, totally that, it. I know. Yeah, I've had a couple of hours to get used to this idea that there was someone who wow. didn't know that audiobooks existed. So, um, hmm. but, but he was like, oh yeah, I love to listen. And I was like, well, what about podcasts? He's like, what's a podcast? I promise you, yeah, right? Wow. I didn't just go yeah. back to 1984 and then come back to 2018. Like I legitimately had this conversation two hours ago. Uh, but he was like, oh, that's interesting. I was like, if there's anything you're interested in, any particular topic you want to learn about, you there's a podcast about it. Or there are podcasts about murder mysteries and unsolved mysteries and all sorts of fun things. You can just find all sorts of things to listen to while you're doing other things. And he was, he was, I, I totally changed his life today. It's, it we amazing. forget how in a little bubble and box we are in thinking we that are. this is all normal. Like, oh, of course mm-hmm. this is normal. Yeah. And you guys that's listening right now, you're ahead of the curve. Just so you know, yeah. you actually know what a podcast is and listen to yeah. them. Yeah. That's awesome. But I would do what you're saying. And I would say, I listened to a, a fantastic book called Mind to Matter. Hmm. It's all about how the brain works and meditation and all sorts of things. But at the end of every chapter, he said, for the long play version of this chapter, go to blah, 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 blah. And he gave a URL and you could go to this page for the end of every chapter. And there were videos to watch and interviews that he included and scientific studies you could reference. And that's you. Write a shorter chapter and then say, yes. (laughs) have a live conversation with so-and-so about this, or let me give you my two cents because I'm the author and I have more to say about it. I just don't want to write it down and have some fun with it. But it can be a shorter chat. It can be a shorter book because of that. Or is that looked down upon like a shorter book? No, listen, here's, here's something that you, that you will want to know. A book that is a hundred pages or more. So 50 pages, one page, one and two, one, right. Two sided. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll have writing on the side of the book. 
So the only book I have handy is this one, and it's really thick. Okay. But in order for printing to go on a spine, the book just has to be 100 pages or more. You can also have little tiny books like this size, right? This is a three by five card, but you could actually have um, my four by six cards right here. So I have a book that's this size, four by six. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because it fits inside a suit jacket pocket. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So You're you creative. can make a tiny book that's 100 pages and it will have writing on the spine. But at the end of every chapter, you can say and join me at Iamagenius.com <laughs> forward slash chapter two for more information on this particular topic. That's awesome. That makes yeah. me feel less stressed over creating a very a long form book and I can actually do it the way that I kind of want to do it instead of the way that everybody quote unquote tells you how to do it. That's awesome. Well, and traditional publishing has said, and I know we need to wrap up, but mm -hmm. traditional publishing is that in order for a book to feel substantial, in order for us to charge $29.95 for it, it needs to be hardcover, it needs to be 300 pages, it needs to be a certain size. Yep. And now we live in the world of you get to do it the way that it works best for you.com. Yay. Yeah. Traditionally published first book. Now learning my lesson. Second book. Yay. Thank you, Honoré. <laughs> I appreciate and that. And you just might know someone who could help you. I don't know who it would be. I know. I'm She's there. really pretty too and got really nice hair from uh, some random guy that doesn't know what podcasts are. Guy who doesn't read, but he's really good with the hair. And ultimately that's what matters. <laughs> Seriously, we need we need people like that also separately. That, I would rather come out with good hair than like 12 books to read and like going to the fix-it salon See? later. See, yeah. we get to have choices. All right, the last question that I have to ask is what's one action out of all this, one action that reader, the readers, that listeners can take this week to move them forward towards their goal of a million. I've never said readers ever, by the way, so thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> listeners. Okay. You're welcome. You know what? Mindset is the number one, the number, my number one hack. Um, so I'm going to give you one because you asked for one. And I held up my three by five cards. Right now, th these are my 10 points that I'm writing in my book. Go get a stack of, these are three by five cards that are, that are post-it notes mm -hmm. and work on your mindset. So write an, an, a present tense, positive affirmation, whatever it is that you want to say to yourself. So I am a writer. I am an author. I am a millionaire. I am. And, and Hal Elrod, my, my uh, co-creator of the Miracle Morning book series, or I'm his co-creator. Anyway, we co-create. I don't know who's first. <laughs> Who's on first? Um, but he would say, write, I am committed to this, this, and this. There is no other option. Write that affirmation and put it every place. Put it on the visor of your car, in your shower. My cleaning lady was like, do I clean around? I was like, clean around the affirmations. It's fine. There's no dirt under there. It's fine. I have one. And it, I used to not talk about it because it was very woo-woo and out there. Yep. But I have no college degree. I've never taken a writing class. I was a millionaire by the time I was 28. It was affirmations. So if there's one thing that I can tell people to do, it's watch what you say when you talk to yourself. Because your words go out and they become things. They, they are substance. They create things. When you're talking to yourself, say, I am committed to X or I am X. Have your I am alphabet. I am amazing. I am beautiful. I am courageous. I am determined. And say what, you know, what, watch what you say when you talk to yourself and have the words of the things that you want to create facing you at all times. That's my, that's my tip. I have 150,000 more of them, but <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> Well, next week, tune in. <laughs> <laughs> every second of every day, we have a new tip from Honor. Yes. <laughs> but I, I have to highlight that one too. I, I even have a, I have a guided meditation that I had created for me with my specific affirmations that I wanted also because I didn't realize how big of a deal I was either until I started diving into the neuroscience behind uh -huh. it. And now you're like, oh, it's all supported by science people. So please do what she says because it totally works. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Where do we find all your books? Because I know you have a million and I can't list them all. Amazon. <laughs> Amazon. will, you know, be the, be the first step, right, for finding more about me. But my books are all on Amazon for sure. Yes. And they're all linked. So you find one, you'll be able to find all the rest of them, which is amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. We've loved spending time with you. Thanks, Jamie.
Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to check out more amazing resources, I'm only curating the best of the best. Go check out eventualmillionaire.com. You can take the Eventual Millionaire quiz, figure out where you are in business and what you need right now. Plus, you can look at curated resources specifically for you on the new Start Here page. I'm so excited. Please join us. Please let me know if you need anything at all. I'm here for you. And have a fantastic day. Bye.